Well, good morning, church family. How's everybody this morning? So it's great to be back. I was here, as uh, Pastor Terry had mentioned, I was invited uh, graciously to be the pastor of the children's camp that happened here just a month or so back, and it was uh, uh, an honor and a privilege and just to see God move and work. So a little bit about me. I grew up in uh, Clarion County, went to Clarion High School. Some of you guys know me. Uh, many of you know me, seeing a lot of great old faces, um, or mature faces, sorry about the, the, <laughs> the thing. This is my family. Uh, unfortunately, my wife, Debbie, she wasn't able to be here. Uh, we met here in Clarion, and going to be celebrating 15 years of marriage this September. So when time flies by, it flies by. Like some of you I haven't seen for since we were dating and up here, so it's like, you guys won't mind if we only go to 2 or 3 o'clock because time just flies by when good things happen, right? Uh, so, but she had a prior engagement. She just became the director of women's ministry at our church, and they had a big thing to kick off. So she was, unfortunately, had to be there and wasn't able to join us. But three of my daughters are here today. They're sitting up front here with me. My mother's here, um, still lives in the area, and so we get back to the area and everything. So, and my little boy is with my uh, daughter. He was with his best friend yesterday. So, dad's not really important when he's with his best friend. So, uh, but that's that's good. He uh, so we're blessed with the four children, and I'm um, just uh, honored to be here with you guys today uh, to be able to give you God's word and just let Him to uh, touch your hearts and uh, open your minds, and that you may be able to see the goodness of Him but also be prepared for the protections that we need to do. My title today is uh, Being a Believer in the World of the Deceiver. And I think that a lot of us and some of the things I'm going to talk to you today about, you're going to just understand that the deceiver himself is deceived the church, this nation, the people of this world, in a great way, and that's his full-time job, and he will stop at nothing to do that. Before we do that, let's ask God to join us and, uh, as we open up his word. Father, I just thank you for this church family that's here today. God, I pray that you just open the minds and hearts and souls of each person here today. Lord, that they might be receptive to your word, that it might change and transform their lives, that they may understand your goodness, knowing that Regardless of the circumstances of this world, you've given us a promise that we can hold on for the eternal years ahead. Jesus, we love you and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Starting in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, I want you to, as we read this scripture, I would just want you to imagine Paul's talking to Timothy here. And it just literally paints a picture of today's world. Put it up on the screen for me, guys. Second Timothy. It says, but mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents. I'm not saying anything to you there, children. but um, Ungrateful, unholy, without love unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, teachers are treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the, its power, having have nothing to do with such people. Paul was warning Timothy here of the times and literally when we read this scripture, we see what's happened over the last year and a half and what's been going on in our world of just how society wants to do what it wants to do and there's such bickering and division and brokenness in the midst of it. And this isn't what you're going to say, well, geez, we're going to break this all down. No, it's not. I'm going to be taking you around God's word today a little bit to show you Normally, I like to come into something, and I like to break the Scripture down, I like to go through it, but today I want to kind of say there's something more behind this. God's Word is good, and it teaches us, but there's something more behind that that I want to just caution everybody here today to understand that we get caught up in 
as believers. We all struggle, we all have problems, but behind that, what is it? It's an evil one who wants to destroy us. He wants to stop at nothing to make sure that you become worthless to God's plan. The crazy thing is in Barna, Barna has studies, some of you may have heard, many of you may have heard, uh, Barna is a study group that studies a lot of the Christian realm, so I, I just looked up some of the things. Here's some interesting statistics, and not statistics or anything, but it gives us a picture to understand. So in this study Barna did, he said that 78% of people believe that God is holy. Now he's talking to Christians here, self-proclaimed Christians. He's not just talking to just a random person walking down the street. He's actually talking to Christians. Only 78% of them believed that God was omniscient, omnipotent, all-powerful. 22% of them didn't believe that. Now, they're supposed to be Christian. They're supposed to be believing this. 22% said, no, that, that's not true. So then we come to the devil. So we got God himself, only 70, 78% of believing that he's all-powerful. The devil, the interesting thing about the devil, 59% of them thought that he's a symbol and not really a being. He was a symbol of evil, 59%. 40% had strong feelings of, yeah, the devil is possible. So really, only 40% of Christians believe that Satan actually exists and is actually out there battling against God. It becomes deeper rooted as I began going down through the statistics. So I originally went into these statistics to say, hey, who is the devil? Who does people think the devil is? And as I went farther into this statistics, I became intrigued. Now, mind you, we're talking about Christians. 39% believe that Christ sinned. That becomes a problem when we begin looking at his all-powerfulness and what we believe in a true point of our doctrine. 46% actually believe that he was holy, that he had all about. But still, that's less than half of the Christians that were surveyed that believed that he was all holy and did not sin. This blows my mind. Five or six percent of them just didn't really know. Just was like, ah, I'm not sure about that. So I kind of throw them back into that 39% and be like, well, that, that's a problem. The Holy Spirit, as I went on one more step, the Holy Spirit, 58% felt the Holy Spirit just a symbol of God's goodness. Not really a part of the Trinity. He's just a symbol out there that God is good. So we use the Holy Spirit as a sign that God is good. 25% thought he was real. Folks, did you hear that? 25% of Christians only believe that the Holy Spirit is real. 25%. There's a problem there. There's a deep-rooted issue in the hearts of Christians. 18%, he's kind of real. 9%, pff, not even sure. So I give you those statistics to start off to say deception is it happening? Psst. Yeah, guys. And is it our fault? Yeah. Pastors across this land, and I'm not even labeling myself in this as a pastor, but just simply as a speaker of the Word of God, we're messed up. Like, boy, Tom, you're bringing us a real hopeful message this morning. <laughs> We've got issues that we need to correct so our culture now let's look at our culture so let's just step off that moment let's look at our culture and see where our culture is our culture is literally if you don't know it just fake it until you make it right you might not know the answer so my whole key is is that I literally just tell you what I believe what if it's truth or not that's that's what the culture does I mean just you guys, will, I know there'll be, some of you will be on Facebook later on today, and you'll be going through, and you'll, you'll see 
10 different contradictions to one subject because it's what everybody's opinion is. And that's what's brought a lot of brokenness to this country, to everybody, to people, to Christians, to non-believers. Nobody knows what to believe because it's, well, I believe it. It's what I said, so it's truth. So it's my own truth. So rather than coming back to the word of God and finding out what is truth, we just make up our truth. That's culture, okay? Solution is believers, Okay, as we're sitting here, you say, okay, Tom, that's a problem, but how do we fix that? Let's go over to 2 Timothy. You guys put 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. For all of God's word, it's God breathed. 2 Timothy uh, 13, or 16 and 17, guys, can you stick it up on the board for me, please? I'm sorry? You don't have that one? Okay, I'll look it up. Apologize. I had it marked here. All scripture is God breathed and is for the useful of teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that man of so the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Guys, from Genesis to Revelation, it's not just a storybook. If we're a Christian, if we understand God's truth, that we believe that God sent Christ to the cross to die for our sins, to be able to bring us to eternal life, and everything that's involved with that from Adam and Eve to the creation of earth to the very final days and how it's all going to end and the defeat of Satan and what we'll get to and we'll celebrate, every word in that is God's truth in our direction for correction, for teaching, for rebuking, and for the edification of the body of church. And if we don't get that, we miss it. God's word will not lead you astray. There will be times you'll read it and you'll say, that kind of contradicts each other. You got to read a little deeper. And if you don't have your nose in the word, get it in the word. I don't care if it's five minutes a day, ten minutes a day, fifteen minutes a day, whatever it is, do something. Because just wondering what it is or saying, yeah, I know John 3.16, that's awesome, that's a good start, but let's keep going. So get our nose in the word and know that that is our basis. That is the word of God, that is the truth. That is where we start and that's where we begin. Now let's go to the deceiver himself. Let's go over and see, like, what his attributes are. What do we got to be prepared for? What do we got to watch out for? And again, I can't begin to cover it all today or this morning, or otherwise we would be here until 2 or 3 o'clock, or maybe for a couple more days and, you know, whatever it leads. But we're, we're going to just kind of take a little snapshot of, okay, what does he do? Looking at Satan, who is he? What can he do? What does this do? Number one, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. He's the prince of power of the air. What does that mean? As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So, when we were non-believers, when we didn't have the truth, Satan ruled us. That's his, that's his gig. That's what he does. Okay? He blinds those whom are not believers. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel. That displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. He's a deceiver. He blinds those who don't know Christ. They're blinded. So how do they see? Us. Us. We're the light of the world. Guys, they watch us nonstop. My children watch me nonstop. But guess what happens? Sometimes they act like me, and I'm going, <laughs> why was I acting like that? And it's humbling. Believers do, non-believers do the same thing to us, folks. I, one of the comments was, it was funny, I come walking in here, uh, Ross, I don't know where you're sitting, I'm blinded by the light up here. Uh, there he is back there. When he sits down, he's not so tall. Um, so 
He goes, you're friends with John Weaver? He's like, I wasn't expecting you to be here preaching. I was like, I don't know what to kind of do with that, but yeah, I'm here. <laughs> so, but it's like, yeah, I, if we threw everything I've done in my lifetime up on this screen, I wouldn't want to be standing here and probably not ever want to be seen by any of you. And it'd probably be the same for you as well. And praise God for the, the blessings of who he is and sending his, si his son to the cross to die for us. That's washed away. Yeah. That's the power in the blood of Christ, that it is gone as far as the east is to the west. And we no longer have to relish in the moments of where, where we screwed up, but we relish in who he is. So don't let your past beat you up. God can transform your life no matter what. Sorry, I got off on a tangent. Number three, his power is limited. So we see Christ, or not Christ, we see Satan. He doesn't have unlimited power like God does. Amen. He's a scumbuck. He doesn't have all, almighty power like we think he does. Okay? Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity. So that by this death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. So Hebrews is talking here about Christ coming and demolishing the power in which Satan used to have. Satan used to hold that power of death. He no longer holds it. When Christ died on the cross, it eliminated it. So guess what? He's powerless. In fact, go back to the book of Job. Begin to read the book of Job. Let's jump back to the Old Testament and get excited about the Old Testament. We're only not here for the New Testament, folks. The Old Testament's just as important. Job. What happened in the book of Job? Where did Satan go to? He went to the throne room of God and said, um, God, what, what, who can I test? And God gave him permission to go after Job. The devil himself had to ask for permission in order to go do it. He doesn't have unlimited power. He's limited. So where does he get his power? How does he have power? It's us. We allow him. We allow him to come and become a part. James chapter 4, verses 7, talks about submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. There's the answer, guys. Ladies, teenager, children. Submit ourselves to God. Resist him. He'll flee from you. He doesn't have power over you. As a child of God, there's no power in which Christ can, or that, that Satan can come in and take you over. He will flee from you. Now, does that mean he gives up? No. He'll continue to come in. He'll continue to poke and prod. If we allow him, he'll take over. Again, Satan is the same guy as what the world is. He'll fake it until he makes it. He knows he's lost. Guys, read the Bible. What's the story in Revelation? What happens to him? He's thrown in the lake of fire. He's cast into the pits for eternity. He's lost. He knows it. He knew that whenever, he knew that before Christ was even going to the cross because he was tempting Christ not to even go to the cross. He knows the story. He knows the ending. So what's he do in the midst of it? Well, if I'm going to lose, I'm going to be a cheap shot, right? Have we ever watched whenever anybody is a sore loser? What happens? They try everything impossible to try to mess up the situation. That's Satan. That's his game. He will do everything to trip you up and cause you to fail. He'll do everything that he can to not do it. So what's his ultimate goal? His ultimate goal is to hurt God himself. He can't he can't physically take the power and hurt God because he has no power to do that because he's defeated. But if he can hurt you guys, if he can hurt you as the children of God or any child of God or hold any believer from coming to know Christ, guess what? 
He's hurt God. Because what's God's desire? That everyone should know him. Amen. So if he can hurt you, if he can cause you guys to begin to bicker and cause you to begin to argue amongst one another as believers, he wins. He has no power, but we let him in. First Peter 5, 8. This is his goal. Peter's talking, you know, Peter's the cornerstone of the church. God set him up to be the rock, the corner, the foundation of the gospel. And I love Peter. I mean, Paul's awesome. Paul has way more writings of all the different books into the Bible. But Peter himself, just as this passionate guy, you know, who loves to cut people's ears off and then watch God put it back on. I mean, you know, part of it is I always joke, I think it's neat, you know, Peter slices the guy's ear off and he's probably looked at it and said, watch this. And Jesus puts his ear back on the soldier. But Jesus, or Peter's this passionate guy and he's, he's talking here. And he had talked prior to this, he talked about the, the elders of the church and training up the young and to be sober minded and so forth. But be alert. And sober-minded, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking, looking for someone to devour. Folks, if your heart's beating, your blood's pumping through, the, through your veins, and you can hear my voice this morning, he wants to destroy you. Many times I don't get to hear this be preached, and I didn't come today. I mean, I went through this. I asked Pastor Terry, I said, what do you want me to preach on? He goes, brother, whatever you feel like it. And I thought, whoa, <laughs> I can let him have it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but seriously, when I, when I, when I said, asked him, he's like, whatever you desire, I said, okay, Lord, what is it you want me to preach on? Let me be obedient to your word and open your word that it might be something that someone, one person in here today needs to hear. But well, let me tell you something. What every one of you need to hear is that he wants to destroy you. And you need to live a life ready, prepared, self-controlled, alert, because he'll stop at nothing to do it. Being self-controlled, being alert, just give you a couple verses that you can write down and so forth and put into your Bible. Some of these I gave to the guys. Some of them I didn't uh, because there's, there's just a lot of them. Again, it's God's word. It's, it's for teaching. It's for correction. It's for giving you all that guidance to help you. The armor of God, Ephesians, putting on the armor of God. Paul gives you a whole thing of saying, hey, put on the helmet of salvation. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Do the shield. All those different attributes of God to do to begin to protect yourself. If you're not doing it, you're not protected, guys. So open up the Word of God. I urge you, I plead with you, I ask you, I beg of you. Open up the Word of God that you might see His goodness and understand His truth. The other verse here, um, I apologize here. I forgot to write down the, uh, the reference there. Six, ten, eleven, 11, and 12. You have that verse? Did I give you that one there, uh, Ryan? Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power, Ephesians 6.10. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take up the stand against the devil's schemes. Verse 12 then. So again, your armor of God going up, but you can stand up against his schemes. Verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of even evil in the heavenly realms. Again, guys, Paul's sitting here telling you, in the midst of all this, the battle he rages on, it's not against flesh and blood. So again, th there's this sense of saying, well, okay, if I focus and I don't, uh, I don't cuss all the time, I, I, I control my language, or I'm not caught up into 
what's on the internet or I'm not caught up into a relationship that is wrong or I'm pure and I'm keeping everything focused on. Guys, it's not only just what's happening within our flesh. It's also a spiritual battle that's waging on to take us out as well. Fighting against temptation, our fleshly desires, our eyes that behold, our pride to be right and not be wrong. That's constantly a thing that we battle for on a daily basis. Our desire to be the right person, to do the right thing. Our, our pridefulness to be, quote unquote, successful. What is success in this world? To have a perfect job, to make lots of money. Nothing wrong with that. It's not, nothing wrong whatsoever with having a good job and making money and doing well. But what's your heart then behind that? See, one of the lies is a good friend of mine just preached here just a few weeks ago. And he used the word, he said, you know, if, you're, if your heart, if your heart says do it, do it. Follow your heart. That's the word of the, of the culture. Just follow your heart. What's the word of God have to say about your heart? Terry looked at me and goes, evil. That's right. It's desperately wicked. And it's only by God's grace and mercy do we have the opportunity to be pure. Amen. Following your heart, it might work for a little bit. But unless we are following after Christ and checking our wrongs with his right, it's going to lead you down a path of wrong. Coming back to our culture and what Satan has done well with our culture, and just to talk to you a little bit, not to step away from the Word of God, but let's look at reality. The freedom of America, you're like, oh, geez, he's going political. No, I won't go political on you this morning. I just want to talk to you about freedom. Freedom in America was established as a place in which we could come The forefathers set it up that we could come and we could be free to seek out our religious freedoms and understand. But in the midst of that, there's still law that you had to follow and obey. Today, that is gone to a degree, and we fear that it's going to be gone completely because now it's the freedom to do as you please. No matter what you do, how you do, when you do it, that's the thing to do. But on the other side of that, there's a part of that that says, oh, wait a minute, you Christians, you kind of guys are funny. You're not allowed to follow after that. You're not allowed to seek that out. So that's the interesting thing about the deceit that's out there. You can have freedom to do whatever you want to do, except for only if it's within man's way where the forefathers did it and said, seek it out and do it as God's way. As you walk through D.C., any of you have ever been to D.C., Scripture's all over the walls of D.C. And they, in fact, that's where we're talking about the cancel culture that wants to erase that. So we know that the forefathers had foresight to understand it wasn't about them, though we talk about them, it was about him. And the guidance of that to be able to follow that Christ's ways were the ways to keep society in check. When I think about Satan and what he does, what saddens me the most is when you look at the person beside you, we usually treat them the worst. Whether it's our wife or our spouse or, you know, our kids, our husband, our family, we usually attack them the most first. 
Some of you in here need to say a big sorry to the other one at some point. Our friends, we come about and we begin to have relationships within church churches and they can be some of the greatest relationships I think of this big belly sitting here in the third row back drinking coffee Jack Hooven can't miss that belly anywhere (laughs) he still calls me Tommy so you know we have a good relationship you know this man I've watched him he is a force of protection retired state police officer I've heard the stories of him. He knew my grandfather years ago. But I've also seen him cry and blubber like a baby because he's seen the goodness of God work. And that bride has put up with you all this time too. And I know she slapped you around a couple times when you've needed it. (laughs) But the awesome thing is, is the relationships that have been built there for years, I I can joke with Jack I can go down there and I can squeeze and hug his neck, which I'm going to enjoy to do later on here, and especially as bride and set beside him. Those relationships you can build in church are some of the greatest things you can have. But you know, the sad part is there's another side that happens that people get upset, they get ticked off, and they get up out of their seat and they walk away because somebody didn't put the right color of carpet down or they didn't paint the walls the right color, or they didn't have pews that had pads on them. Whatever the issue is, it's totally frivolous and doesn't mean a lick for eternity. And that is where it starts to divide. And that's where then Satan wins. He takes that point and he just starts to drive it home. He doesn't have to say anything at all about God not being the savior, savior of the world and sending his son to die on the cross. See, that's the thing, folks. Satan isn't using and saying God isn't the the Savior of the world. Satan's not this little red pictured thing with, like, black tights on and, you know, they don't, you don't even hear that. In fact, what I say in the statistics, half the people don't even believe the devil even exists. So that's not even the argument. The argument is you, his children. He's taking you, the children, and he's, it's just like, sorry, children, I'm using you guys. Sometimes you guys argue at each other over a silly little toy. Some of you sitting out there today are arguing over a silly little toy. And you got to let it go. If we set our focus on him, that stuff doesn't matter. And if we begin to lay our eyes and our focus on him, we begin to act like him. Paul says, pick up your cross daily. doesn't say pick it up every now and again or every Sunday. Sorry, I'm going to make you uncomfortable here for a moment. It's not about every Sunday, guys. Now, I'm also not saying show up to church every moment the doors are open. You got to be here. Come on, let's go. But I am saying we have a responsibility to open up his word and begin to read. If you have questions... I'm sure there's people in this church, and I know there's people in this church that will help you get there. Ryan, that last slide, if you can put that up. Satan's desire that which is meant to be good for us to be destruction toward God, but God's desire for what is to be destruction toward from Satan is to be good for God. So in other words, what Satan desires is what he tells you is good for you, whether if it's that wrong relationship, whether if it's you to be right, whether if it's to seek out the wrong things of the world, he says, this is going to be good for you. It's going to be great. But he wants it to be destruction toward God. But the awesome thing about that is because of Christ's death on the cross, God uses that for his good. So you've maybe made a mistake. You might be sitting here today. You maybe have made mistakes. You're maybe in the middle of a mistake. God wants to turn it for his good. I don't know every one of your stories. He does. 
Guys, I had a part of my testimony, and some of you know this testimony. I start, I don't even know if my mother knows this story. This is kind of funny. Um, 17 years old, sitting in the church, in the backseat pews of Zion with a bunch of teenage kids in youth group, and we're playing out a drinking party on the uh, envelopes, the offering envelopes, because we didn't have text back then. So some of you teenagers, that's how old I am. We had to write on pencil and paper, you know, from the pew envelopes. Planned it all out. And this is just how God works. So we're sitting there, planned it all out, had the guy buy us the booze. The funny thing was, nobody knew where we were going to meet, so let's meet at the church. Everybody knows where the church is at, right? Everybody meets at the church. The guy brought the booze to the church and said, okay, let's go off. So we went off, we partied, we had a good time. Uh, What Satan said was good time. Had a great time. Everybody left. Two days later, I'm coming home. We had Pastor Randy and Pastor Randy at that time. So some of you from the old days of Zion understand those names. It was Randy Rupert. Came in, Pastor Randy Rupert. He's walking down my, or my sidewalk when I'm coming home for track practice. I'm like, oh, that's weird. Why is he here? God said, hey, Pastor Randy, how, what can I help you? And the first thing he says, I'm disappointed in you. I was like, oh, he knows something. Uh, so... He, there was a lot of rumors going around at that point, and so I kind of set the record straight and said, hey, here's exactly what happened. What you're hearing in these rumors aren't true, but yeah, this happened. So that Wednesday night, I thought, I'm not going to go to youth group. And at that point in time, I hadn't experienced forgiveness to the level of what Christ forgives our sin. So I thought, uh, I'll, I'll skip it. I won't be there. Well, that explained exactly why Robbie Spencer, who was a good friend of mine I played football with, the senior pastor's son, wasn't in school, nor was Hope, his other daughter. And I was like, oh, okay. That, that explains why they were in school. Um, so I thought Wednesday I was going to talk to Rob. He didn't show up to school again. So I thought, well, um, all right. This is my gig. This is why I came to a conclusion. If I go and they accept me, I'll think about going back again. But if I go and everybody's upset at me, I'm not going back. I'm good with this. That church thing can be what it is. Now, mind you, my prior things of this, of going to church, I'd been to church uh, when I was little, hadn't went around uh, through my middle teen years, and then Robbie invited me to youth group. And so it wasn't I never didn't believe in God. I just didn't understand the relationship to have with God. I always believed, yeah, God's out there. It's kind of like one of those people that said, yeah, God's there. I guess he can be all-powerful or maybe not, or I don't necessarily understand that at all completely. But I believe definitely God existed. So I went that night. Our youth pastor at the time was a guy named Mark Simmons. Mark Simmons was a few years ahead of me in high school. And I was old enough to know I knew the decisions that Mark made weren't always the right decisions as a teenager, but I'd also just watched him change his life and become a youth pastor and saw that transformation. Mark came out that night and he goes, hey, he's like, something's happened to our youth group. We're just going to sit here. If you want to talk about it, feel free. Let's talk about it. If you don't, we're just going to sit here. It's like, okay, that's kind of weird. So Robbie got up and he began to tell a little bit what happened. He sat down. I for whatever reason, it was like my legs just overtook me, and I stood up, and I was like, all right, I'm going to, I guess, talk about this. Talked about, Mark said, okay, and he presented the gospel. That night, I got to be saved. So that wasn't the end of the story. Pastor Randy came in that next Sunday, and he goes, hey, uh, I need you to go up in front of the church, and I need you to tell them what happened. I'm like, What? You want to say that again? Because I didn't hear you. I <laughs> didn't, your words didn't come out clear. I didn't understand the words coming out of your mouth. He's like, no, I, I, God has done a great thing. So in the midst of this, there was some bickering between the two pastors. You can't control your son, the son. But nonetheless, there was some troubles in the midst of that. And, and Satan was trying to divide that church over some decisions that we made upon our own. But I'm here to tell you guys, without telling you to complete and going on for another 15 minutes of the story, 
God changed my life. God took that situation that was meant to be destructive and put it for his good. So I come back to you and say this. What are you struggling with? What's Satan defeating you with right now? Who are you arguing with? What relationship are you in that you shouldn't be in? Is it a family member? Is it someone you need to make a phone call to later today and say, hey, I'm sorry. I was a fool. I messed up. You fill in the blank. Maybe you're sitting here today and you go, geez, Tom, all the stuff you're talking about, knowing Christ, I kind of know what you're talking about, but I'm not certain. This is a time for you to know him. Amen. It's time for you to start that relationship. Yeah. Stop believing the lie that Satan has you blinded and you don't know. Him. Today's the day I know there's people sitting here that would love to lead you to him. Amen. So as I begin to close and I ask for prayer, these stairs, this altar is open. If you need to come to pray, and you need to ask for God's forgiveness because of where he has you, where Satan has you at this moment with his finger hold on you, and you want to be pure and clean and get things right. Maybe it's your marriage that's struggling. Maybe you need to come as a couple. I don't know the answer, but I know God knows your hearts, and he knows where you're at and knows where you need to come. I want you to come, and I want you to pray, and I want you to lay it at his feet. Amen. If you want to know him, I know Brother Terry's here. Myself, I'll gladly pray with you. Father, I just thank you for the opportunity to come and share your word and your truth. Father, I pray for these folks that are here. I pray that uh, your love and your mercy and your grace abounds throughout their lives. Lord, we're all a bunch of messed up people, and it's only by your grace and mercy are we able to do anything in your name. I pray for those who are sitting there that need your love and your restoration. Lord, may they come. I pray for those who don't know you, may they come. Jesus, be with us throughout the rest of the day. In your name we pray. Amen.